Hello, everyone. My name is Shellen McCoy. I'm the Conservation Program Manager here at the Atlantic Salmon Conservation Foundation, and I would like to welcome uh, everyone at today's webinar. Uh, the series is made possible in part thanks to the contribution of the Government of Canada. For today's webinar, we are very pleased to be hosting Dr. Sean Godwin. Sean is a conservation biologist and quantitative ecologist. He currently has a postdoctoral fellow with Dr. Jeffrey Hutchings at Dalhousie University, where he is investigating the impacts of salmon farms on wild salmon populations. In 2018, Sean finished his PhD at Simon Fraser University in BC on the effects of sea lice on wild Pacific salmon. His research interests around evidence-based conservation and management, particularly in the marine environment. He likes to use field experiments, big data sets, and statistical modeling approaches to tackle questions about aquaculture, sustainability, and threats to imperiled wildlife. Today, he looks at salmon farming in the era of climate change. Uh, after this afternoon's presentation, uh, we'll be opening the floor for questions and answers. Uh, if you do have questions at that time, I will give you the instructions on how to go about it. It could be via chat or you can raise your hand and I will unmute you so you can ask the question yourself. But for right now, we'll turn over to Sean so he can start his presentation. Welcome, Sean. Thank you very much for the introduction. That's great. Um, yeah, hi everyone. My name is uh, Sean Godwin, as was mentioned. I'm a postdoctoral fellow um, at Dalhousie University, um, which is a kind of research position after you've done your PhD. Um, and today I'm going to chat to you a bit about some of the research I've been doing over the last couple of years um, at the end of my PhD and during my postdoc, um, which is so far focused on the interactions between climate change and the salmon farming industry and uh, the implications for wild and farmed fish. Um, oh yeah, uh, the intro covered that I did my PhD at, in, in Vancouver uh, and um, at Simon Fraser University, and I uh, am now at Dalhousie University, but a lot of my research is still on the Pacific Coast, so I still live in Vancouver. Um, yeah, so I thought I'd start off with kind of a broad um, uh, message in that um, pathogens and parasites, which is kind of what I'm going to be focusing on today, um, the emerging is one of the major threats to wildlife worldwide, not just in the marine environment, but everywhere. Recently, we've seen huge population crashes in uh, North American bats uh, due to white nose syndrome in mammals worldwide because of bovine tuberculosis, um, in honeybees because of varroa mites and amphibians because of chytridiomycosis, uh, in many, many other species, many, many other pathogens and parasites. And in each of these cases, we've been trying to manage these diseases for years with limited to make success. And that's because limiting the spread and impacts of disease in wildlife is actually really difficult. And one of the biggest questions that researchers and wildlife managers uh, have right now in understanding and managing pathogens and parasites in wildlife is how and whether climate change is going to affect these dynamics. And that's especially true in marine systems. And that's because managing the threats and, of pathogens and parasites in marine wildlife is generally more difficult than on land. And that's because diseases spread on average 10 to 100 to even 1,000 times faster in the ocean than on land, because we really often don't see the results of marine disease um, because everything is underwater. And one of the major sources of concern for marine disease is aquaculture. And so aquaculture is the farming of aquatic organisms. Aquaculture operations typically raise a lot of organisms in a small space. So um, like a uh, nightclub and COVID or any other uh, analogy you want to make, um, flu in elementary schools, agriculture facilities do provide ideal conditions for disease to proliferate just by their nature, like a lot of agriculture. But agriculture is also a really important set of industries. We have a growing human population with an ever increasing need for protein from seafood. And, oh, sorry, and uh, we can't, Build that protein need from wild populations anymore. So this um, is the first uh, graph that I'll show you. Um, on the bottom here, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but in the, on the bottom you have a uh, time series from 1950 to 2015, and on um, the left side, the y-axis, you have uh, production of seafood, and this is um, includes both fish and shellfish. It's by the FAO. 
And as you can see, in, since 1990, we haven't really been able to take any more out of our oceans, and that's despite um, uh, a stable or increasing effort. But we've had a growing human population with a growing need for protein, and to step in and fill that void, aquaculture has had to, um, to, to fill that gap. And that kind of explosion in aquaculture in the farming of aquatic organisms since the 1990s, um, that has been termed the Blue Revolution. And on top of providing much needed protein to a growing human population, aquaculture is also a huge source of jobs worldwide, um, most of which aren't in North America and in places that often need um, economic boost. So I like talking about aquaculture generally before I get into salmon farming, because in Canada, especially here on the Pacific Coast where I live and do a lot of my work, but um, also on the Atlantic Coast, uh, most people think of when they think of aquaculture, they think of salmon farming specifically. But salmon farming actually makes up a really small portion of aquaculture globally. Just in terms of fish, um, salmon, uh, Atlantic salmon, which is what the vast majority of salmon farming is, even on the Pacific coast. Uh, Atlantic salmon are uh, the only marine fish on the top 10 cultured fish species, and in fact, the top 15 cultured fish species. Um, but they are also the most valuable, and um, that is a really important part of this equation when talking about, about salmon farming, which is what I'm going to get into. Um, so, uh, for those who aren't, uh, who have who have trouble picture what a salmon farm is, um, this is kind of what it looks like, at least on the Pacific coast. Um, each of these squares in this uh, salmon farm is an individual open net pen. Um, so, these each of the, uh, a salmon farm will hold hundreds of thousands of fish, and a one like this might be kind of an average size uh, that might hold five hundred thousand. Um, some of them hold upwards of a million. Um, these net pens are open to the environment, as I mentioned, so they allow water um, as well as pathogens and parasites to pass freely uh, uh, through them. And they're also um, almost always Atlantic salmon. So Atlantic salmon just are a great fish to farm. Um, they go quickly. Uh, they have relatively low mortality. Uh, there are a couple farms out here on the Pacific coast that do farm Pacific salmon, like Chinook. But most of the open net salmon farming worldwide is Atlantic salmon. Um, and as you can see, they um, usually are uh, positioned, located on the, in the near shore marine habitat, which is also the same uh, habitat uh, used by many wild salmon specialists. To give you a sense of how salmon farming fits in the Canadian aquaculture picture, um, in 2017, which is, I just haven't updated uh, this slide in a little while. Um, we probably have data from 2019, um, but uh, Pacific Canada and Atlantic Canada were relatively comparable in um, their, uh, their aquaculture uh, production. Um, but there's a bit of a difference in how, uh, how that's broken down. On the Pacific coast, it's about two thirds uh, salmon and a third uh, mollusks. And uh, on the Atlantic coast, um, it, the vast majority is salmon at least in 2017. Um, and because of the controversy surrounding the environmental effects of salmon farming, which I'll get into, um, salmon farming makes the news regularly, both here uh, in BC, where I am, uh, and also globally. So um, we've had uh, many, many news stories and, um, and uh, kind of major events involving uh, First Nations uh, here on this coast, um, finally getting um, a bit of power to uh, talk about salmon farming, uh, salmon farms operating in territory that, that they uh, often are not wanted in. Um, this led to, uh, a few years ago, this led to actual occupations of salmon farms following the Occupy Wall Street movement. Um, there was a recent report uh, that was published talking about the global uh, farm of salmon farming and how kind of the cost benefits uh, laid out in this uh, made major, pretty much every major news outlet around the world. Um, and uh, on the Atlantic coast, uh, there is, um, there's a lot of talk about expanding the salmon farming industry in different provinces, um, and it's just, it's just always in the news. And a lot of the reason why it's a controversial topic, a lot of reason why it's in the news, um, is due to uh, this, a parasite called sea lice. 
So this is what sea lice looks like. This is a very bad infestation, not a normal one, on a wild juvenile salmon. Um, again, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but each of these um, kind of circular structures is a sea louse. The kind of white lines are, um, are egg strings. Uh, those egg strings will eventually get um, uh, broken up and dispersed into the environment as, as eggs in the larvae. Um, and sea lice are a group of uh, parasites that live and they feed on the surface tissue of fish. <clears throat> um, they are native parasites, meaning that they were here before salmon farming. Um, but they, um, the, that, it's a very interesting topic to discuss when you talk about them being native parasites, um, because that's often used as a, an argument for oak salmon farms, um, you know, don't, uh, change anything to do with sea lice dynamics. The, the difference comes in is that salmon farms, uh, kind of change, uh, how the dynamics of the system work. So, um, as an example, uh, here in British Columbia, um, salmon farms act as year-round reservoirs of sea lice that didn't normally exist. So um, in the absence of salmon farms, wild juvenile salmon don't normally really get infected with sea lice. And that's because they're spatially, uh, they're separated in time and space from adult salmon. So if you ask any fisher who brought up adult salmon in the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, they will say that adult salmon have always had sea lice on them. Uh, you know, sometimes they'll bring up a, a fish and they'll have uh, sea lice uh, down near the anal fin often. Um, but juvenile salmon kind of very rarely ever got them. And that's because uh, here in BC, adult salmon uh, come back to spawn in the fall. They lay their eggs. Uh, uh, the eggs then, um, then grow and hatch. And then the juvenile salmon leave the rivers in the spring to migrate along the coast of the ocean, oh, open ocean. And so the adults and the juvenile salmon don't normally overlap. So the sea lice on the adults can't transfer to the juvenile salmon. Salmon farms kind of break this separation, providing year-round reservoirs for sea lice, where sea lice on adult salmon coming back in the fall can transfer to the salmon farms. They can then amplify on the farms over the winter and are then there along the coastal migration routes for juvenile salmon to pick up as they migrate out in the spring. And this is kind of an, an image um, that, that, that describes it. So on the outside, we have the salmon life cycle um, where we have adults coming down and laying eggs. Those eggs then, then hatch and they grow into salmon fry eventually that then migrate out as smolts to the ocean and then migrate along the coast to the open ocean where they grow as adults feed and then eventually come back to spawn. And normally the adults and these juveniles come out at different times. Uh, and to break this separation, salmon farms um, have kind of stepped in and provided year-round reservoirs where sea lice can transfer from adult salmon to the farms, amplifying the farms over winter, and then spill back onto the juveniles. And that's important because the sea lice don't really make a difference for um, adult salmon. I mean, they, they will obviously, any parasite will have some effect and it does affect farm salmon, um, but uh, the but the major effects that we see are in juvenile salmon, and that's because they're smaller, um, they lack fully developed immune systems and fully developed scales to help protect them from the infection. I'm not going to get into all the nitty gritty of um, of the literature on sea lice effects on salmon, um, but there is a really like, kind of robust history of 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 studies, a lot of which were done in Europe, some of which were done on the Pacific coast, very little relative. Some, some has, obvi has obviously done, been done in Atlantic Canada, but not as much compared to those two places. Um, but sea lice, um, the effects of sea lice on farm and wild salmon can be quite severe in some cases. Um, they can affect their behavior, like how risky they are, uh, like how, how, how much risk taking they, uh, behavior they, they take, how they school together that kind of thing. It can affect them at the physiological level, um, their immune systems. It can affect uh, their swimming ability. Um, they certainly affect their growth and their body condition. Um, they can have direct effects on survival. Um, they can affect uh, how, much, how often they're eaten by predators. Predators specifically choose uh, sea, uh, salmon that have sea lice on them. And um, sea lice can affect wild salmon at the population level as well. This has been found in large-scale 
uh, release experiments in Europe, uh, as well as correlational stock fruit studies in British Columbia. <clears throat> and it's not just wild salmon that sea lice affect. Um, according to a recent study uh, that was focused on Norway, the biggest salmon farming country in the world, um, sea lice are a huge pest to the salmon farming industry. Every year, the industry uh, loses roughly 9% of its revenues due to sea lice. Um, for many reasons, uh, they can reduce the growth rate and body condition and survival of their hosts, so it affects um, their bottom line in terms of uh, the product that they're raising. Um, but also, salmon farming companies have to use expensive treatments to control their sea lice populations on the farm. And this is done in a number of ways. The first way that most salmon farming regions try um, is a parasiticide, essentially a pesticide, a chemical that's, co that's put on the coating of um, of the food that is given to the farmed fish. Um, this is called emmectin benzoate, or uh, slice is the trade name. Um, and it's a really effective method when salmon farming first comes into a region, but eventually sea lice usually gain resistance uh, to uh, that chemical. And that's the case in Atlantic Canada and, and in starting in Pacific Canada now and all throughout Europe as well. So there's a lot of other um, uh, alternative treatments that can be used hydrogen peroxide bats. Um, there's biocontrols where they take other fish like rats and they put them in the net pens to uh, eat sea lice off of the salmon. Um, there's infrastructure changes like making uh, bubble nets around the farm to try to limit transmission. Um, there's uh, also um, developing technology uh, involving lasers, which I'm not kept up on um, in the last couple of years. I know that initially there was, uh, uh, there was some problems because the lasers would often recognize the eyeballs of salmon as uh, lice um, and cause a lot of blind fish, but I think, it's, I think that's uh, developed a lot further past them since then. And while trying to control sea lice is um, tough and expensive, it can also have positive conservation outcomes. So um, this is a, uh, a graph where on the bottom, uh, you have a year, and on the y-axis on the left, you have the number of sea lice per wild juvenile salmon in British Columbia. And so in salmon farming came into British Columbia kind of late 1990s, early 2000s, and people started worrying about sea lice just around that time, and so in, in on the Pacific coast. And so in the early 2000s, there was really no regulation in terms of sea lice on salmon farms, and what we saw was that um, sea lice on juvenile salmon uh, were, were really high. And this was associated with a lot of mortality at the population level as well. In 2003, um, the farms in this particular region followed, meaning they didn't, um, they didn't have uh, um, uh, uh, fish in their net pens. But in 2001, 2005, we saw high numbers of, of, of sea lice on wild salmon, wild salmon due to that, uh, due to infestations on the farms. And then right around this time, um, there was a management and policy inter intervention that required that the salmon farms have to start treating uh, their, um, their fish when they break a certain threshold in terms of number of lice per fish. So the farms started treating around this time, and then in that, from 2006 to 2014, we saw relatively low numbers of sea lice on wild salmon, which was associated uh, with populations that did better. Um, then in 2015, we saw a spike in the number of sea lice on wild juvenile salmon that we hadn't seen uh, since um, the bad years. And um, there was a lot of uh, concern about this because, um, because of chemical resistance in other regions and things like that. And ultimately, it shook down that this probably came about because it was a really warm year. Um, we had a, 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 a particularly anomalous um, uh, kind of heat, marine heat wave uh, that happened, um, and that caused, or, or we think, um, higher sea lice numbers. And so that kind of raised the eyebrows in terms of, okay, what is going to happen as our coastal oceans continue to warm, and how is that going to affect um, sea lice and their effects? And the reason that this makes sense is because sea lice develop a lot faster at higher temperatures. So on the bottom here, we have temperature with higher temperatures on the right. And on the y-axis on the left, we have the number of days um, that, the, that the sea lice take to develop to adulthood, essentially. And as you can see, as temperature gets hotter, 
uh, the, they develop much faster. And so their development rate increases. So that means that, you know, at 15 degrees compared to seven degrees, you can have three or four generations of sea lice uh, in, um, in, uh, in uh, which is a big difference from just one. So that leads to a lot of my, my research questions that I've been focusing on the past couple of years. Um, and uh, the first question, the, the main overarching question is how will climate change influence the impacts of sea lice on the wild salmon? Um, and, and I'm going to talk about this in kind of on kind of two fronts. The first is how will climate change affect the abundance of sea lice on wild and farm salmon? Um, and then the second is how will climate change influence the actual effects of sea lice on their host? So that first question, um, do warmer temperatures increase sea lice abundance on salmon farms? Um, this is where salmon farms are primarily located in Canada. So on the, on the British Columbia coast, um, which I don't expect you to be aware where these regions are, we have these kind of hot spots of salmon farming and on the Atlantic coast. We have a couple hot spots as well through Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, um, and Labrador. And this and the, the second half of this is going to be stuff that was done in the Atlantic coast, but the first half is going to be talking about stuff that I've done on the Pacific coast. And that's particular that's because BC, British Columbia is a one of the most interesting places in the world to study these issues. And that's because BC is the really the only place in the world has a really large production of uh, wild salmon as well as farm salmon. Um, and as a result of our huge wild salmon populations here, um, BC wild salmon are of immense ecological, economic, and cultural importance to the peoples uh, uh, here that are settlers and also the indigenous people that have uh, interacted with salmon for time immemorial. And a lot of the controversy over salmon farming here um, is because wild salmon aren't doing very well. So this is a figure showing how the production, the catch of salmon has decreased over time. Some of this is associated with management changes rather than just the abundance of salmon, but really for sockeye, for the three species that most people care about the most, sockeye, coho, and chinook, um, this is relatively reflective of how they're doing along the coast. At the same time, farm salmon have increased drastically. And these two, uh, these two lines, are, may not be related to each other in any way. And in fact, um, there is uh, no relationship here on, on, this, on this graph at all. I could put the jelly bean production over time and, and it, would, it could look the exact same. Um, but this goes a long way to explaining um, how the reason behind the public pushback towards it, um, towards farm salmon uh, and the controversy around it because um, concurrent with huge declines in wild salmon, we also have a burgeoning salmon farming industry. So um, to figure out how, whether higher temperatures are going to increase uh, sea lice numbers on salmon farms, um, we have a wonderful data set here in British Columbia that is not present on the Atlantic coast, which is why I was able to, to do this out here. Um, so out here on, um, on the Pacific coast, salmon farms are required to count sea lice on their fish at least once a month, usually twice or more. These Counts are performed by the salmon farmers themselves and reported to our Federal Fisheries Department uh, uh, DFO. And, now, and then they get publicly reported online four times a year. Obviously, there is um, some kind of obvious potential conflict of interest there where the salmon farmers are the ones doing the counts. And uh, if those counts are too high, then they're obligated to perform expensive treatments to bring down sea lice numbers. And so in an effort to kind of ensure accuracy of counts, uh, DFO um, occasionally sends out auditors to salmon farms uh, to, uh, to make sure that everything is going okay. And what they do is they'll do their own separate count at the same time as the industry count, and then they'll compare the two. And if they're similar, then they'll say, great, those were pretty similar. And if they're not uh, similar, uh, then they'll say, okay, well, we need to increase um, training or whatever for uh, these for these farmers to make sure that their future counts are more accurate. Um, which is a decent system for when they're there. Um, the problem is that audits are relatively rare. They only happen about three to four percent of the time. And so 
one of the things that we had to account for in this analysis for this climate change analysis was okay the counts that are reported um you know what happens when when the auditors aren't there do counts stay the same like are they just as good or do they um or do numbers go down when you know they don't have the dfo people looking over their shoulder so i'm not going to go into the details of this analysis in any way um but uh, uh for those who are interested i'm happy to talk about it later um but basically uh it, we we fit a statistical model to these data that accounted for everything that we could think of in terms of what might affect sea lice population dynamics. Um, you know, whether or not the uh, the farm had been treated recently, whether or not it had been audited recently, what the last month's count was, you know, how the population growth was going according to temperature and salinity and like where there was on the coast, and also, you know, how um, whether or not there's colonization of sea lice from external sources like um, uh, like from wild salmon populations or wild herring. And what we found, um, well, the first thing that we found, which is not about the climate change thing, but just about that audit thing, um, was that unfortunately counts are lower when DFO isn't there. So this is the decrease in counts when count, when the farms are not being audited. What we found that was for one species, Lepidopteris salmonis, one species of silos, they decreased a little bit so that when farm when the DFO wasn't looking over the shoulders, um, counts were about 84% of when the, the 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 DFO auditors were there. And then for the other species, Calgus clemency, um, uh, about um, counts for about half of, of what they were when DFO auditors were there. Um, this was a result that was obviously uh, extremely um, polarizing and it created a, a, a quite a mess in my life for a, for a week or two as I uh, talked to different reporters about this. Um, but ultimately, it's not that surprising. I mean, including industry experts uh, and and people within DFO within the audit program, no one was really surprised that you know things are more accurate when you have um, you know someone looking over your shoulder, or or, or or rather you have a DFO auditor on site. Um, but that had to be accounted for. But to get into the climate change stuff, um, this is essentially um, what uh, what happened in that bad year of 2015. So. Um, 2011 20, uh, to 2016, uh, we had accounts that typically oscillate so that in these gold times, um, when and these are times of the year when are which are called the sensitive period, it's when wild juvenile salmon are migrating in the ocean. So that's when all the management is focused on keeping sea lice counts on salmon farms low. So in 2011, we found that sea lice counts were lowest in the year during this uh, juvenile wild salmon migration. Sea lice counts on salmon farms were kept on being low, ev lowest every year um, to protect wild juvenile salmon in accordance with policy and management. But in 2015, this didn't happen. And so uh, in 2015, we had high counts on farms and therefore high counts on wild, wild salmon. And ultimately, um, what uh, we found was that this was due to that that temperature uh, um, increase that I mentioned. So um, here I'm just going to show you kind of what um, we found in terms of what an average sea lice count uh, uh, looks like across the, the British Columbia coast um, from January to, de to December for an average calendar year. And this is on farms. In an average year, kind of this is what the trajectory looks like. It minimizes in the spring. Uh, during that wild juvenile salmon migration. This is the uncertainty around that kind of mean prediction. But in a high temperature year like 2015, uh, or with the conditions of 2015, we found that, that, um, that, that the whole thing really bumped up, especially during this juvenile salmon migration, this critical period that we're trying to reduce sea lice numbers on salmon farms uh, for. And what we found was that on average, in according to the conditions that we, the, that we had in 2015, we find that that, that, that those numbers in the wild uh, during that migration are two and a half times higher, um, which is a fairly big deal. We also found that um, really there are kind of management options for, uh, for, for, um, for kind of reacting to warm years that one could use. Really, you could just treat have an obligatory treatment right before um, before the wild juvenile salmon migration. If every farm did that, that effect basically goes away and brings it down to uh, exactly what it would be in an average uh, heat year. And so 
um, ultimately what we found was that um, our uh, the, the 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 current policy and management strategies aren't really resilient to environmental change. Um, we know that sea lice abundances are going to get worse on, on farms and therefore on wild salmon uh, as our coastal oceans continue to warm, and we need to um, kind of make our management policy, our, our management strategies and policies about that parasite control. We need to make them more resilient uh, to those warming temperatures. So that second question um, that I that that we asked uh, kind of about this climate change issue with uh, sea lice on salmon farms um, is: Do warmer temperatures accentuate the negative effects of sea lice on uh, Atlantic salmon? So this was done. Um, using a lab experiment on Atlantic salmon, and this was done at Dalhousie, and this was um, was done uh, with um, with funding support um, from the Atlantic Salmon Conservation Foundation, for which we're very thankful. So uh, we ran an experiment um, where we took um, juvenile Atlantic salmon uh, and we uh, put them in a in a suite of uh, tanks. Um, each of these blue uh, cylinders is a tank, and we took a, took these salmon. Uh, for those of you who know Atlantic salmon very well, you'll notice this is not an Atlantic salmon; it's a Chinook salmon. But uh, we took Atlantic salmon and we put pit tags in them so we could follow them throughout the experiment. Essentially, we could know which one was which at the start of the experiment and the end of the experiment, um, and that allowed us to weigh and measure them before the experiment and at the end. We then um, split the salmon among uh, different tanks, and then we ch and then we change the temperatures of those tanks to create a range of temperatures from 10 to 22 degrees. Um, and we did this um, uh, many many times in many many tanks, um, such that uh, we had um, five temperatures with zero sea lice in them, and then but we also had um, five temperatures that we infected with a small number of sea lice. Um, we then did the same, uh, but um, with different fish in different tanks, but with a high number of sea lice. So that in the end, we had five different temperature treatments and three different uh, sea lice infestation levels, uh, from zero to low to high. And so then we had 15 combinations of temperatures and 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 sea lice levels, and we did each of these combinations in triplicate. So we had 45 tanks. <clears throat> and um, this was done a couple years ago, uh, and I think I, I don't usually show this when I when I talk about this experiment, um, but I thought that those on the Atlantic coast might um, be uh, particularly interested. This uh, um, experiment happened, and we were trying to aim for the temperatures to be 10, 13, 16, 19, and 22 degrees. Um, but about on day 0 0.5, uh, Hurricane Dorian <laughs> hit the coast, and it messed up um, the source of the water, which was the Halifax Harbor, and it, it killed uh, all the power uh, which was required for maintaining these temperatures in the Dalhousie Aquatron. Uh, the backup generator Dalhousie didn't work. And so uh, it was a very fun experiment uh, to try to figure out. It involved some 24-hour efforts by a lot of people to try to separate these temperatures. In the end, everything kind of converged on the temperatures that we wanted, and temperature separation was maintained throughout the whole thing. Um, but it was uh, a really good lesson in how best laid plans, even in a, in a kind of a very controlled laboratory environment, can uh, go wrong. Um, oh, yeah, so this is what it looked like. Um, on the left, you have kind of the big, kind of a big, big initial holding tanks that we got the fish, the Atlantic juvenile Atlantic salmon in, and then we uh, pit tagged them, measured them, and distributed them into uh, these smaller tanks that were um, infected with sea lice uh, and changed to certain temperatures. Um, this is how kind of what the salmon looked like in general in terms of their size, and on the right side you can see a picture of um, a fish. That was pretty representative, actually, of a fish in a high temperature treatment, sorry, a high infestation treatment, and um, that kind of um, uh, that all of that on, on the dorsal surface of the head is from sea lice that were on top of the head, kind of uh, uh, feeding on the surface tissue um, of the fish. <clears throat> so the questions that we were asking of do warmer temperatures accentuate the negative effects of sea lice? Uh, infestation on Atlantic salmon, these could be answered by this kind of really fairly honestly large scale um, uh, experiment. And the three kind of things that we were looking at were um, in terms of negative effects were growth, 
body condition and survival. So I'm going to show you a series of three graphs, and I think that's it for the um, in terms of uh, data for the um, for the talk. Um, so hopefully you'll bear with me. On the bottom here, we have temperature across our temperature treatments: 10, 13, 16, 19, and 22. And on the y-axis on the left here, we have growth rate, where a zero growth rate means that the fish did not gain any weight from the start of the experiment to the end of the experiment. A positive growth rate means that it gained weight between the start of the experiment and the end of the experiment. We have three infestation levels from zero to high. And what we found um, was that uh, for the clean fish, the fish that didn't have any sea lice on them, the zero infestation fish, um, they all had positive uh, well, not every individual fish, but on average, um, the the different temperature treatments all had positive growth rates, but that uh, growth decreased with increasing temperature. And that makes a lot of sense because salmon um, don't just don't do well at higher temperatures in general. Um, they have to spend a lot more energy uh, to uh, maintain their bodily functions, and so that energy can't be put into growth. Um, for the low infestation treatment, we found that 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 the that, that effect of temperature on growth rate um, that that uh, was um, made even worse by sea lice infestation. Um, and then the same thing for 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 the high infestation treatment to the point that by the time you got to 19 degrees, fish actually had negative growth from the start of the experiment to the end of the experiment. They lost weight from the start of the experiment to the end. <laughs> Um, we found a very similar thing for body condition. So body condition is kind of a metric, uh, how plump a fish is, you know, given its length, how much weight does it have? And it has a different relationship with temperature than, than, than growth rate. Um, it's, it's kind of got this, uh, this curve to it with, um, with temperature. Um, but what we found, again, was that as um, temperature increased, um, so too uh, did the effects of sea lice on their hosts. So sea lice accentuated the negative effects um, of higher temperature and higher temperatures accentuated the negative effects of, of sea lice. And then finally for uh, the survival uh, um, part of the experiment. So um, this is a different figure, so I'll walk you through it. Each of these panels is one of the different temperature treatments. So we have 10 degrees, 13, 16, 19, and 22. And on the bottom, we have basically the duration of the experiment from zero to 40 days. And then, oops, sorry. And then on the left, on the y-axis, we have the probability of survival. So a one would be that all the fish in the experiment uh, were, uh, were still, still alive. And a, uh, it goes got down to 0.4 on this, on this graph, but a zero would mean that none of the, uh, none of the fish survived. And then the low temperature experiment, as expected, very few fish died, and there wasn't really any any um, any difference between the infestation levels. That makes sense. Ten degrees is a great temperature for for salmon. Um, the fish were pretty happy in the experiment. Uh, there was some level of background mortality, but not very much. Um, for 13 degrees, there was a little bit more mortality, a little bit more separation, but not much. And the reason that those lines don't extend all the way to 40 days is because the experiment was done uh, for one sea louse life cycle. Uh, from by the time we infected them as a, as a baby, as a larval sea louse, um, to, uh, to the time that they were kind of ready to die as adults. And as I mentioned before, at higher temperatures, the sea louse life cycle uh, becomes shorter, so the experiment was shorter. Um, at 16 degrees, again, more mortality, a bit more separation, 19 degrees and 22 degrees, to the point that um, uh, about 40% of the fish were dying in the high infestation, high temperature treatment. So again, what we found was that um, higher temperatures accentuated the known negative effects of sea lice. And, and we found that for both growth, body condition, uh, and survival. And so this is a kind of a really important uh, um, thing to find out because it means that as our coastal oceans continue to warm, we can expect that the negative effects of sea lice are going to continue getting worse, both for wild and for farm salmon. Um, we are currently following up on this um, uh, experiment. Uh, we recently just got the data for this, which I'm really excited about, to see um, how uh, those relationships um, uh, kind of pan out for both 
um, the immune function of the fish um, via some genetic work that we did, um, as well as their stress levels via uh, cortisol measurements in their blood. And then I'm just going to briefly mention, um, I had a wonderful uh, undergraduate honors thesis that, that, that worked with me on this. Um, and uh, she found some really interesting things as well, which she published uh, for her first um, scientific paper this year, which was really exciting. And she found that at higher temperatures and at higher sea loss abundances, um, salmon livers were smaller and their hearts were larger. Um, and this is a really interesting finding that, that I honestly wasn't expecting um, because um, salmon livers are associated with um, their, their energy reserves. So if they have smaller liver, it, it, it implies that they have smaller energy reserves. And counter to what you might think, abnormal heart growth uh, is associated with reduced cardiac performance as well. Um, so we found that that was both surprising and very interesting. Um, so again, um, this, uh, these are where um, salmon farms are on the Atlantic coast. And I just kind of wanted to put um, this, ex this experiment, these results in context, because the Atlantic coast is projected to get particularly hit by climate change in terms of um, the sort of sea surface temperatures of, of um, uh, as uh, over time um, due to climate change. Um, there was a re big report that came out um, in 2019 um, uh, that said that um, mid-century summer sea surface temperatures um, are projected to increase in Atlantic Canada um, of up to four degrees off the maritime provinces, um, but limited to two degrees off of Labrador. And so um, this is uh, going to, over time, um, become a a pressing issue um, if sea lice are of concern to um, uh, people uh, in Atlantic Canada. And um, to be honest, um, there's very little research about the effects of sea lice um, uh, on uh, fish in, the, in Atlantic Canada, um, which is surprising to me in some ways and not surprising to me in others. It's not surprising to me in some ways um, because there, it's hard to study juvenile Atlantic salmon because they're um, in Atlantic Canada, because there are a few of them. But it is surprising to me in some ways because there's a major, <laughs> because sea lice are a major, major thing on Atlantic salmon farms. Um, this is a figure straight out of the Atlantic Canada Fish Farmers Association report from New Brunswick. Um, this is pretty much all I could find in terms of recent sea lice numbers because there is no requirement for data transparency by, the, by industry. Um, on the Atlantic coast, like there is on the Pacific coast, there's no, you know, you can't look at a data set like you can out here. Um, and what we found was that on each of these lines, the different um, management zone in New Brunswick, and there, these are average sea life numbers on farms across those, for each of those zones. Um, and their, their numbers were on this, usually between five and 20 whites per fish on average. And to remind you, in British Columbia, when, uh, when sea lice hit three lice per fish on an individual farm, um, they have to treat for, for, uh, to reduce those numbers. And on average, the farms are probably like one to two lice per fish. And so on the Atlantic coast, it's five to 20 with no requirement for management intervention. In Norway, the number is 0.1 female lice per fish. So there's a very big difference in kind of the numbers of sea lice that are found at the Atlantic coast compared to elsewhere in the world. So to summarize the, uh, this presentation, um, we can expect that the abundance and effects of sea lice uh, will increase um, as our coastal oceans continue to warm. Um, we probably need to improve policies so that parasite management um, strategies are resilient to climate change. And this may be particularly important in Atlantic Canada, um, where there is minimal regulation um, and data transparency uh, of sea lice on the same. And I'd like to uh, thank you, thank the ASCF. Um, I'm very, very grateful for the opportunity to talk to you today and also um, for their support of our work in the past. Um, and I've had, we've also had many other funders and, uh, and, um, and co-authors and, uh, and technicians supporting this experiment uh, and the other work that we've done. And um, I, I've said we throughout this, this talk because it truly has been a team effort um, in every component of any research that I've been a part of. So that's it for me. I'm uh, very, very uh, um, happy to answer any questions you might have. Um, uh, yeah, so I'll probably end it there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sean. Thank you very much for that excellent presentation.
we will now, we do have time left for the session, so we can open up the floor for questions and answers. Once again, you, if you want to ask your own question, you can raise your hand. I will unmute you so you can ask it. If you want to write it down, type it in and I will read it out loud for you. So I see we already have a question coming in here. Let's see. It says, Sean, are there any suggested, oh, just a sec here, I'm gonna open up my screen a little bit more to read that. Are there any suggested strategies for sea lice management going forward? Um, that's a very uh, broad question. It really depends on the on the region. Out here, we're just starting to deal with resistance to um, that chemical that I mentioned, uh, eminent and benzoate or slice on, on the uh, food. And so here, my recommendations would be to really diversify the strategies um, for, um, uh, for controlling sea lice on salmon farms. So not just focus on the one that has basically been the only method of treatment until 2018, but instead really diversify and learn from Atlantic Canada and Europe in the different methods that they've had to use because they've had resistance for, for a long time. Um, having farms with fewer fish in them will always uh, mean that sea lice um, will uh, are have a, have less less chance of getting out of control. Coordinating treatments on salmon farms so that you know multiple salmon farms at the same time treat at the same time so that you know sea lice one farm doesn't just go down and then the sea lice from the other farm then transfers over to to, to, to another. Um, on the Atlantic coast, I'd recommend you know if people are actually worried about sea lice on wild salmon um, uh, or on the farms uh, that you know actual management strategies and policy and regulation might help um, to get in line with the rest of the world. Um, yeah, happy to answer any specifics, but those are kind of the off-the-cuff uh, remarks, I'd say. All right, thank you, Sean. Um, we do have someone that raised their hands. Uh, Guillaume Dauphin, I'm going to unmute you. Sec here. Oh, it's a lot harder on you than I thought here. Okay, I just sent you an unmute request. Hello, can you hear Go me? Go ahead. Yes. Hey. Uh, Guillaume Dauphin, TFO Golf here. Uh, thanks for your presentation. Uh, really interesting to um, to see what's going on on the uh, West Coast, and uh, nice to see that uh, DFO can be useful uh, in some sometimes. Um, I'm just talking about the counts of the the lices versus when the industry is just on their own. I'm just wondering on your figures for the Atlantic side and the um, the lack of study on the numbers of lice on juveniles. I'm just wondering if it's because of the localization of the, um, the industry right now, where it is, um, where most of the farms are located are where there are very little Atlantic wilds population. And on the, um, the places where there are higher, higher population, there are lower numbers of, of uh, aquaculture. And I mean, in, in our samples, in the main catchment, in the Miramichi and the rest, it was really very, I mean, we very rarely see any lysis on juveniles, either smolts or um, 0 plus, 1 plus, 2 plus. So I'm just wondering if this is something like the special localization of the current industry, if that's a factor. I'm, I'm sure it is. Um, as I mentioned, I haven't done any actual field research on the, on the Atlantic coast, which is why I really limited kind of any discussion on that. Um, one thing that I, um, in terms of, you know, why there's a difference in, 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 in knowledge on the West Coast compared to the East Coast, the Atlantic Coast, um, it, like ultimately it just comes down to, it's way, way, way easier to research wild salmon mm -hmm. and the effects of farms on wild salmon out here than out there. When I have researchers visit um, me for field work from Norway or from the UK or from, uh, or from the Atlantic Coast, um, they come out here and, you know, I say, okay, we're going out today and we're gonna go catch you know, some salmon, like, oh, how are we going to do this? Uh, like, is it going to be hard? And then, you know, 10 minutes later, we have 10,000 juvenile salmon in a net off the side of the boat that took about mm -hmm. five minutes to get. Um, it's just, 
a different, just because of the abundance that we have out here, it's a lot easier to do any any research to figure that out. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that that's really a big contributor to the gap in, 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 in knowledge, to be honest. Um, uh, that, that being said, it sounds it sounds like you have a much better sense of of you know where the uh, the migrating wild salmon populations would actually uh, be passing the farms than I do on the Atlantic coast. So I, I think that uh, you're better qualified to answer that question than I am. Hmm. Thanks. All right, thank you, Sean. Um, we have a, another question here via text or chat. Um, Dr. Alan Curry is asking, and he says, thank you for the presentation. Do we know if Atlantic salmon smolts have the same schooling behaviors as their specific, uh, Pacific salmon relatives? Um, I don't know the answer to that question. They definitely school, whether, um, but they come out at, at, at larger sizes than most of the salmon that have been researched on the, on the west coast of Canada. So most of the research on um, the uh, the effects of salmon farms um, on wild salmon has been done with uh, a lot of it's been done with pink salmon, which come out as unstable fry. They come out as three centimeters um, from the river, um, and uh, they school really near the surface and in huge abundances, like tens of thousands. Um, they just like cloud the water sometimes. Um, and so uh, the schooling behavior of Atlantic salmon, which come out as, as, as much bigger, would probably be much more similar to something like coho salmon or Chinook salmon out here. Um, uh, but again, I've never worked with Atlantic salmon in the field, out there, so I can't give any details. Okay, thank you. Now I'm trying to unmute Donald Hutchins here. He's got his hand raised. Send a mute request to Mr. Hutchins. Hello. Hello. Okay, you can hear me? Yes. Is the C in ice count procedure the same for Canada as Norway? And is there a reason or temperature at which they should not be counted? And is that difference between uh, North America and Norway? Is there a temperature at which sea life should not be counted? Like as in because of the health of the salmon that they're counting or? Uh, apparently in Newfoundland, they say the companies don't have to count sea lice uh, at colder temperatures, but that is the Polar temperature has not been defined. Why would that be? Um, so, uh, sorry, the first half of the question was, is there a difference in how sea lice are counted? Um, uh, there's probably minor differences in how sea lice are counted, but ultimately comes down to the same thing. Um, they they uh, catch fish, they, they herd fish within one of their net pens, they take a subset of them, so they'll take 20 fish or 30 fish or however many for each region. Um, they'll anesthetize them or kill them, um, and then they will uh, um, eyeball them to count how many um, of the adult sea lice are on them. In uh, Norway, if they count specifically the female adult sea lice, in British Columbia, they count any either male or female, pre-adult or adult, but ultimately it's just different variations on the same thing. Um, why would um, they say that they don't have to count sea lice at low temperatures? My guess, but again, it's just a guess, would be that because sea lice don't reproduce, don't go through their life cycle very fast at low temperatures, that sea lice numbers are just lower at low temperatures, and so therefore they aren't considered as much of a problem. If the question was at high temperatures, I would guess it was a fish welfare issue um, because uh, often um, farms are given uh, passes to count their sea lice if there's a lot of algae in the area or high or at high temperatures um, because hurting the sea lice and then hurting the salmon and then anesthetizing some of them um, can be uh, um, really hard on them, uh, especially to do it often. And so therefore they might be given the pass. But about the colder temperatures, that would be my guess, but I'm, I'm genuinely not sure, sorry. So is the sampling done by cage, by site, or by farm? Or, or company? 
Um, on the Atlantic coast, I don't know. Um, in uh, Norway and in um, and in uh, British Columbia, um, every farm individual site is obligated to do it um, at a certain frequency uh, in during the wild juvenile salmon migration here. So in the spring months, it's once every two weeks. Um, in uh, for the rest of the year, it's about once every month. Um, and every individual farm has to do it. Um, the uh, like farm site. The companies themselves are responsible for their individual farms, and they'll do a subset of their net pens. So if they have 10 net pens, they'll have to do three of their net pens or whatever to do um, 20 fish from three net pens or something. So it's not just all from one. In, in Newfoundland, the reported by company, regardless whether they have one farm or 20 farms, and we don't know if it's taken at the first of the month, the end of the month, the throughout the month, and it's obviously averaged over all the sites. Does this make any sense in managing, farm managing or animal husbandry of these sites? I mean, it makes sense if they're trying. So this is something I'm very passionate about as a scientist. Data should be openly available and publicly available, and you shouldn't be hiding it. And so when I, I think, I think if you're trying to, to stop people from figuring out what is going on, um, that's how you do it. You don't make data publicly available and you average it because then, you know, if an individual farm has an outbreak that is really bad, um, if you average it with 19 other farms, uh, then you don't see that in, in the result, right? So out in every other country, in Norway, in the UK, um, uh, in Ireland, uh, out here on the Pacific Coast, sea lights and accounts are made publicly available. Sometimes, like in, in back until 2019, it was done um, on monthly averages for every farm. So if they did multiple counts in a, in a single month, farming multiple counts in a single month, they would they would report the average count for that farm in that month. But it was still by every single farm it was made publicly available, and all that has been made public since like 2005 or something. Like that. 20, 2009, something like that. And all that data is publicly available. Now, every single count on every single farm is made publicly available. A couple months after the fact, but it's still publicly available. And the fact that only two, like something like two or three researchers on the coast who are associated with industry and that, um, uh, and that, only, uh, and, and that industry itself are the only holders of, of these data um, and that you, like no one can, can access it otherwise accept in a very, very aggregated format. Um, uh, I just think that's, that's, that's just a really not a good thing, but that's just my opinion. But data transparency is never a bad thing. Just to clarify, did you say the target before they have to treat it is three in BC? And what was the figure for Norway? Uh, it's three motile lice per fish, which is any pre-adult or adult male or female sea lice in British Columbia. In some regions um, that have uh, um, that have uh, First Nations that have um, kind of more power over the farms, um, that number is down to two. Uh, in Norway, it is uh, there's a traffic light system, but um, in general, it's about 0.1 uh, female adult lice per fish, which kind of equates to about 0.5 motile lice. Per and the aggregated numbers on salmon farms in uh, in New Brunswick, which is like the best data available uh, um, by region, are between five and twenty. <laughs> Orders of magnitude. Yeah. Terrible. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. We have two more questions, Sean. Uh, one's in text, so I will read it. Uh, what is Atlantic Canada doing? Straightforward question. <laughs> I am not embedded in the Atlantic Canada, Canada aquaculture industry, uh, or and I'm sorry, industry and research. Um, I can, uh, and so um, you know, I can speak to the differences between Pacific Canada and Atlantic Canada. I can talk about as a scientist some of the data transparency things are pretty appalling. I can say that some of the numbers of sea lice on the farms are higher than anywhere else in the world um, that I have seen, um, but. I, I can't really speak to the intricacies of what's happening and the nuances of why that is. Um, my feeling, my, my, my feeling is that, you know, 
uh, um, company, like industry and government do what they can get away with. And on the coast, um, on, on this coast, there's so much public pressure and so much um, importance placed on wild salmon from an economic point of view, an ecological point of view, a cultural point of view, um, that there's just been so much pressure to to manage things in a in a in a good way that and and as a, and a lot of the research done on it as well and uh, that they have really no choice whereas uh, on in the, in the Atlantic coast there's been less public pressure and there's been no research really because of um, it's just harder to do that research and so that's kind of my feeling on kind of why it is where it is but I can't really talk about the nuances on it because I just didn't really know. Okay, thank you. We have uh, Leo White. You've been unmuted if you want to ask your question. Um, hi, Sean. Uh, thanks for the presentation. It was very interesting. Uh, like Don, uh, I'm uh, on the Atlantic coast here in Newfoundland. We've recently had some uh, extremely uh, alarming uh, mass die-offs in the uh, aquaculture industry. The most recent one reported was uh, in October, on October 23rd, uh, involving three sites operated by Maui. And uh, the, re the question I have is uh, the uh, information provided uh, stated that uh, the uh, salmon were treated for sea lice and they, they died. There was a mass mortality as a result of the uh, sea lice treatments. Hmm. So, you know, it seems that uh, you got the problem of the sea lice infestation in itself, but then also the stress that salmon go through from being treated. Uh, and also, you 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 probably uh, were aware of the extremely large mass die-off in uh, 2019 when 2.6 million salmon died. And the secondary cause for that was related to, um, you know, many of the salmon that died had been already treated for sea lice, you know, so it's implicated in that mass die off as well. Just wonder if you have any comments on that. It seems like the operators are kind of caught in this vicious cycle where if they treat them, you know, there's the effects of the treatment, which are being quite negative. And if they don't treat them, of course, well, you know what happens then. So that's the question I have. Do you do you remember what, what the treatments were? Uh, they did not say what the treatments were. Yeah, um, I'd be really curious because that is not something that regular that, that has ever happened in British Columbia, and I don't know of it happening in Norway, which I'm a little more on the pulse of than Atlantic Canada. Um, it's not something that is normal or or regular to to have big die-offs from treatments. Um, there are some times when uh, when salmon farms out here, especially in the summer, you know, if, if it's high temperatures, um, they won't treat um, because uh, or they'll or they'll, or they'll ask for exemptions to treat for you know a couple of weeks until until the temperatures go down, just because you know high temperatures are stressful and um, you know bathing your fish in fish and hydrogen peroxide is stressful. Um, but uh, there's never been a, a, a die off as a result, and the um, and like sometimes if they really need to get uh, um, uh, their numbers down or like or else they'll be forced to harvest, they'll do three different types of treatment. They'll do like a freshwater bath, a hydrogen peroxide bath uh, and like and and slicing their fish in the course of a month. And the fish will they did that just the other like just the other week in the Brown Archipelago um, and the fish were still fine. Well, they weren't great, but they didn't have a die off by any sense. Um, so that really surprises me that that was uh, that that was the stated reason or that was implicated because it's not something I've heard of before. Um, it, so they're definitely stressful. These are large. Sorry, sorry yeah, go for These are large numbers. Yeah. Um, the, does, sorry, I think I think we're lagged by like a second. I'd just be really curious to hear what the treatment was, to be honest. And what the yes, other, yes. what what, the, what what it was interacting with, like whether it was really high temperatures at the time or whether there was harmful algae blooms or whatever that they shouldn't have been treating at that time. So this is not a normal occurrence, certainly. Oh, well, the information that you're referencing there wasn't available or wasn't given. Sure. Uh, and also, uh, 
the numbers of fish involved are are quite large. You know, like yeah. the uh, three sites in um, October. Uh, you know, ended up being uh, you know about uh, 220 in one of the sites. 220, 240,000 salmon died. You know, so it's very, very significant. Yeah, I mean, that's yeah, that, that's a lot of fish. I'd be really curious to hear hear about the intricacies of this because that's not something that um, that's not something that happens worldwide, really. So, um, yeah, that's really interesting. In places that do a lot more treatments than Atlantic Canada. All right. Well, thank you, Mr. White. Uh, thank you, Sean. I think this ends our question and answer for the session today. Um, if folks do have more questions and you just didn't get a chance to ask them today, please feel free to me an email with the question and I'll pass it on to our presenter and we'll try to answer that the best that we can. So once again, Sean, thank you so much for today. Uh, for those that couldn't make it today, we did record the session and it will be available on our YouTube page uh, on our website. Uh, feel free to, to let your friends know. Plus, I wanted to remind you that our next webinar will be December 8 with Catherine Smith from Dalhousie University uh, on estuarine warming and cold water habitat loss to climate change in specific uh, rivers. So once again, big thank you to Sean and everyone who participated today and we hope to see you soon. So thank you. I'd just like to add that anyone is also always welcome to, um, to email me directly if you have anything you wanna talk about or ask questions. Um, my email is sean.godwin at gmail.com and you can just search me online and you'll find that email there too if you prefer. Thank you very much for having me. All right. Thank you. Bye everyone.